Murphy Austin Adams Schoenfeld LLP, focusing on business law and commercial litigation, is proud to support Rob on the Road Region Rising. More information available at murphyaustin.com. Up next, take a look at this. The aftermath and damage of what are now being called mega fires. We'll discuss what a public-private partnership is doing to fight mega fires before they begin and hoping to help the forest of the future. And now, Rob on the Road, exploring Northern California. The messaging on this is so important. We all need to hear this. Joining us now is Andy Fecco. Andy is joining us from the banks of the American River Canyon in Auburn. Andy, great to see you. Nice to see you, Rob. Thanks for having me today. Thrilled to have you here on Rob at Home. And let's just get right to the issue at hand today. We are seeing catastrophic impacts not just in California, but across the West. Talk to me about the problem. Yeah, Rob, it's a, it's a tremendous thing in California um, and all across the West, these mega fires that have really cropped up in the last decade where um, not only are people's um, lives and businesses ruined when these large fires come through communities all across the West, but the lasting impacts um, for our water supplies, for our ecosystems, it's just untenable. We have to start doing something about reducing the scale and the intensity of these mega fires all around the West, and particularly the things we can affect here in California, in Northern California. I just have to say, you, because it just caught me when I heard you say mega fires. Wow. Right. It is. And it's a um, it's something it's a term that has just come up and was just coined because there is no other way to describe what happens when a fire burns at the kind of intensity that, for instance, in our watershed, the 2014 King fire burned, where not only does the forest burn, not only do all the trees in the forest burn, um, but the actual soil itself, all the organic material that's in the soil that makes it a living soil burns as well. And when that happens, you not only destroy the forest in the short term, but you destroy it in the long term. It's very hard for things to grow where there's no organic material to support life. We have some amazing visuals that are, are really shocking to see, to show you. Before we do, I wanna ask, do we even have a fire season anymore? No, especially here in California where um, we've had uh, cycles of drought. We've had some very wet years, but during those dry years, um, we, we're seeing fire conditions year round now. In particular, winds that come from the east and from the north that are very, very dry. And those dry winds, even in the middle of winter, can drive fires all throughout California. And unfortunately, we're seeing what used to be just a Southern California um, uh, experience those east and north winds spreading to other parts of the west, to Arizona, to New Mexico, to Northern California, even to Oregon, to places where traditionally we think of having wet winters with lots of snow. It's actually not that way anymore. And it's, uh, it's driving these mega fires. If you're a Californian, fires, floods, particularly the, the and, and the drought from 2013 to 2016, we have earthquakes. We know a lot about things that happen with nature, but the reason I wanted to do this is because you have some good news, some things that can be done. Um, first, this is what the impact looks like in a watershed of the sediment and the, and the runoff. What remains after a mega fire? It, it is really, to me, surprising to see. What is all of this from? Is it just, does it destroy, for lack of a better word, the earth portions? Yeah, when you, when you burn at very, very high intensities like um, the King Fire, like the Rim Fire, places like Paradise, entire communities destroyed um, in fires. And what that means um, really is, is that when you burn at that kind of intensity, that uh, when the soil burns and the trees burn all the way to the soil and the watershed burns all the way to streams like the Rubicon River or the Middle Fork American River, there is nothing to catch sediment. There's nothing to hold water. And so when rain, rains do come in the winter, 
that water hits those slopes and it uh, washes all of what's left of the soil down into our rivers. And that, and that those rivers carry that sediment down to our major reservoirs, places like Folsom Lake, right? Shasta Lake, our major water storage reservoirs for the people of California that sustain us, our farms, our cities, all through the summer when it's dry in California. Um, those reservoirs get impacted both from water quality and for their ability to hold water as they fill up with sediment. It's a serious long-term problem and one that we felt like as Placer County Water Agency, we had to try to do something about. When we talk about watershed and the Sierra Nevadas are tremendous uh, for feeding the watersheds of the en entire state. But it's almost like, think about your lungs. So the, your lungs, that, that's an example of, or an allergy of a, of a, of a watershed all of the things that feed in to feeding your entire body. Is that right? Yeah, that's right, Rob. And so if you think about, you know, the more lung capacity you have, right, the better you can run, the more things you can do. Well, watersheds, instead of holding air, they hold water. And so you can think of them as, as big bowls as well, right? And if you have um, a bowl that has got sponge material inside of it that can soak up water and release it slowly all through the summer. That's what sustains California, our farms, our businesses, our citizens, all through the summertime. But if you don't have that sponge, if you can't hold water in watersheds, whether that's through snow, right? Snow is our biggest water storage device that we have in California. More than our reservoirs, we rely on snow. And with a changing and a warming and a drying climate as we go through the 21st century, if we lose that snowpack, we're going to be even more reliant on forest soils to act as that sponge and release water all summer when we need it the most in California. Your agency has done a public-private partnership, if you will, to really dig deep into to fighting fire before it happens proactive um, and and it even takes us back to pre-settlement days if you will of, of california talk to me about what you're doing at, with your agency in placer county yeah that's right well so pcwa we're a public agency here in placer county and like you've mentioned we serve people to we serve water to a lot of people here in placer and we take that stewardship responsibility seriously we're going to be here forever we're gonna serve water forever. And when you talk about forever, it changes your perspective about what you need to do in our watersheds to maintain them for future generations. And so after the King fire, which occurred here in El Dorado and Placer counties in 2014, it was one of those mega fires. It burned very, very hot. It burned all the soil out. We committed as an agency to do something about the watersheds that did not burn in that King fire. And one of those was in the French Meadows um, basin, which contains one of our major storage reservoirs that we didn't want to fill up with sediment. We didn't want to have those water quality impacts. We wanted to maintain the recreation at that place. We wanted to maintain the ecosystem at that reservoir. And so what we did was try to find partners, um, the County of Placer, the Nature Conservancy, the U.S. Forest Service, the state of California through the Sierra Nevada Conservancy, UC Merced, that important partnership that we brought together to figure out what kind of forest management can work can we do in that watershed that's going to be good for the ecosystem that's going to be good for water supplies and really rob focus on what does the forest of the future look like mm. right um we we know that we have far too many trees per acre in california because we haven't done a good job in the last three decades or so of managing um, forested landscapes so that they can withstand these drier falls, these overall uh, drought periods that we have, these longer droughts we have in California. So we've got to do some active management in those forested landscapes, not only so that they survive what's happening currently, but as we look forward 50, 60, 100 years into the future, what our climate might be like, we want forests. We know the people of California want forests. We know that our customers want to go to forests. So we're trying to design that forest of the future and do it in a way that's um, environmentally friendly, not only just maintaining the ecosystem, but improving our ecosystem, 
trying to get species off of the endangered species list, right? Do it in a way that maintains these watersheds for our children and their children. You know, it, it's so interesting when I hear you say the forest of the future, because the forest that we're talking about now is, is packed and overcrowded. You had mentioned to me, it's like a garden that's been overplanted and packed with too much stuff. And it just, you just can't take care of it. Right. I, I think of the, you know, all across the West and particularly in California, people have gotten smarter about how they use water in their homes, right? We don't have, um, a lot of pe people have taken out their lawns, right? They've taken out high use um, uh, uh, garden type of stuff and they haven't overcrowded their gardens. They've gone to much more um, uh, water friendly landscapes. And that's kind of what we're doing in the forest. We're trying to get a, some places a thousand trees per acre, which is hard for to, for people to even imagine sometimes, but a thousand trees per acre. Whereas pre-settlement conditions, you know, in the um, late 18th century were more like 30 to 50 trees per acre. How did that happen? Just, just not being able to keep up? Yeah, that's it. It's, it's, if you eliminate fire from the landscape, right? And then you don't do active forest management, what happens is the garden gets overgrown, the forest gets wow. overgrown. And so we've done this tremendous job of fighting fires in California um, over the last hundred years, but we've sort of loved our forests to death in that way. We've tried to save every acre of forest by fighting fire. And that's led us to this overstocked condition, this overgrown condition. So we're trying to find a middle ground, right? That Forest of the Future initiative really is about finding a middle ground where we can let some fires burn, but we protect communities with firefighting. That's a really important piece we need to maintain. But in these forested watersheds, let's find a middle ground where we're doing some forest management and we can let some fires burn. And in fact, Rob, put some fire on the ground in, pres in a prescribed fire way when it's appropriate so that we, um, those watersheds can return to their natural condition. Now, with all of these efforts, and, and we'll talk about the French Meadows project after this, with all of these efforts, when you add in climate change, with the efforts taking place, will it still work with the impact of climate change, the high winds, the higher temperatures, et cetera? Yeah, we think it can. Um, you know, Rob, this is a, the French Meadows Project is a pilot, right? It's a, it's a slice of the Sierra Nevada mountains. And um, it's a small slice, but you have to dramatically increase the pace and scale. You have to take the French Meadows Project and duplicate it throughout the Sierra Nevadas. And that's going to take a massive commitment. This is not something that every watershed has a local water agency or a local county that's willing to take it on. You've got, and I think that the governor of California um, and the federal administration have made a commitment to treating a million acres a year in California through um, forest management. We think that's uh, really appropriate. We think it's aspirational. We wanna help folks get there. Um, we're a pilot, we're a demonstration. We hope that the state and the federal government as well as counties and local water agencies can look at what we've done, this partnership we've built and the kind of management we're doing and duplicate it throughout California. If we can do that, if we can make that commitment sort of as a society, we think we can, um, we think we can prepare California for a drying, warming climate and so that our kids can have forests in the future. With the French Meadows Project, what did you do and what did you find? Yeah, so when we, when we looked at the French Meadows Reservoir Watershed, um, it, there's about 30,000 acres of land surrounding that reservoir that effectively acts as that bowl I talked about earlier, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's at about 5,200 feet in elevation, pretty close to where Lake Tahoe is. And so it gets this um, heavy snow load every winter. And then that snow melts in the spring and it fills our reservoir. It's a pretty simple system. Um, problem is, is that it had become overstocked. It had several areas where we had that 1,000 trees per acre. And when you have that many trees per acre, they actually, as that snow melts and sinks into the soil and soaks in, all those trees begin sucking that water out of the soil and using it all summer long. And that's so it reduces the runoff into our reservoir. And so we had this interest of finding, can we, can we reduce the number of trees per acre so they don't use as much water? And can we reduce the number of trees per acre so that it doesn't burn at high intensity? And so 
uh, working with the County of Placer, which has been a tremendous partner. We're the, we're the Placer County Water Agency, but we're separate from the County of Placer. And they've just been so forward thinking as being partners with the US Forest Service and the Nature Conservancy, um, as well as UC Merced, to design forest treatments for that 30,000 acres so that we could reduce the stock, stock of those trees and essentially go in and thin the forest to a level that we thought could survive a mega fire, right? As well as produce water benefits to PCWA. And so that's a mix of hand thinning, literally crews out there with saws, um, thinning the forest so that, um, especially in areas that are sensitive for species, we wanted to use hand crews. And then we have some areas where we use mechanical thing, thinning, more traditional forestry methods, right? So that's sort of the chainsaws and trucks because it was so thick we had to get material out. And then in other parts of the watershed, the, the actually the landscape is thin enough right now that we can use prescribed fire to actually burn, intentionally burn at low intensities at the right times of year, intentionally burn that landscape so that we get the kind of result we need. It's gonna burn those small, thin trees out that aren't very healthy and leave the larger, best trees on the watershed so that those are the best trees for the ecosystem and for the long-term health of the forest. The commitment to doing this is going to take a long time, but the commitment seems to be there. Um, and I'm talking about from, from lawmakers. Am I accurate with that? And does that encourage you? It does. It does encourage me. I think that there is a commitment. I think there's a realization that you can't just spend money um, uh, in all the Western states and in California in particular, just fighting fire. We've had to do that um, over the last decade or so because these mega fires have threatened communities. It's tremendously expensive to fight fires. What we're hoping is that our efforts can lead to a situation where you don't have to spend as much money fighting fires because the forests and our watersheds are in much better shape and can actually accept fire without um, that massive effort, that 4 million acres or 5 million acres burning where you have to spend so much money fighting fire. We want to spend that money on the front end before these mega fires start so that they're less intense. They don't threaten communities. They don't threaten our watersheds. They don't threaten the forest. Does that make sense, Rob? It makes tremendous sense. And I have to tell you, I find it fascinating that a water agency is tackling fire control. I just find that, so, I mean, of course it takes water to fight fire, right? But I'm talking about preventatively. I think that's just fascinating to me. Do you think that's fascinating? And was that what you thought you'd be doing when you entered this career? Yeah, no, it, no, it really wasn't. I, I think that um, it's, it's so interesting because I talked to other water managers throughout the state and I think everybody's starting to realize that this is a group effort um, water agencies take our source water, our water quality, our water quantity so seriously because um, we have that sense of stewardship, I think, all throughout California and the West where we've got customers and we're going to be here forever. We want to grow food, right? We want to serve people's homes and businesses. And that stewardship responsibility, it just took these mega fires to really open our eyes to the fact that our stewardship responsibility can extend to these forested watersheds. Not only does it, can it do that, it must do that. We have to be partners with our state and federal government um, in order to achieve these kinds of um, pre-fire projects. Is there something you would like to say that we can do? Uh, you talk about being a steward of the land, some a shepherd, if you will. What is it that I can do? I mean, I, I live in, you know, downtown Sacramento and, and but what can I do myself or what can someone else do? Yeah, it's so important for citizens to know. I know this This sometimes can feel like a problem that's that's too big, right? It's, it's such a massive thing that citizens feel like they can't um, impact it, but you can, right? So this is a, um, you know, your, your local legislators, your local city councils, there's always ways that people, water agencies, municipalities can help participate. We're putting together a coalition here um, in the Sacramento area to try to bring, to increase our pace and scale of watershed treatment, to duplicate the French Meadows project in other watersheds 
um, um, in the American River Basin, right? It's a it's a super shed, right, Rob? The water that you drink in downtown Sacramento comes from the American River watershed. You're connected to it by the water that comes out of your tap. And your local water agency there at the city of Sacramento is such a valuable partner in, um, in understanding that it's all one watershed, whether you're talking about the groundwater or the water that runs in the American River, the American River Parkway, all of that originates in these watersheds. And so we're really working hard with the Sacramento Area Water Forum and the Regional Water Authority to put together a coalition so that we can increase the pace and scale of forest management so that a citizen in Sacramento can feel connected to the forest management efforts that we're trying to do um, up here on the hill because we are one watershed um, and we think that that's um, a way that a citizen can plug in through their local utility through their local city council to be part of this effort we think it's really important to be part of it as um, as an entire watershed in the american river that's whether you're a citizen in auburn or elk grove or dixon or davis or santa rosa or santa clara i mean i'm just anywhere anybody can have an impact we all live in a watershed rob i, mm -hmm. I remember huel hauser saying that 15 years ago to me we all live in a watershed right and that's so important to connect the people that use water every day in their homes, businesses, gardens, and farms to where it starts, which is these watersheds. Two thirds of California's water supply comes from the Sierra Nevada mountains. We're trying our best to, to protect that two thirds of California's water supply because it's so important to somebody living as far away from me as San Diego, all the way in San Diego, citizens drink water that comes from the American River watershed. We're trying to connect those people to their source water. You know, I have to tell you, I couldn't figure out, you know, visuals are very important to me in, in this program, and I couldn't figure out what the emotional disconnect between talking about fire and seeing the beauty where you are and behind you, and I just got it. It's because prevention works. Uh, steps to take action to keep things from being done in the middle of an aftermath of a fire work. And when I see you next to the American River and that beautiful scenery, it reminds me that, that these mega fires and these horrible impacts from fires can be lessened if we can do these right things. That's right, that's right. And we're, you know, we're figuring it out, right? We, we don't have all the answers. We're figuring out how to live with this new climate reality that we're in right now. And I think that's why it's so important to have a partnership, right? That includes the federal government, that includes the state government, that includes the Nature Conservancy. Really importantly, the County of Placer, one of our most important partners, but then also the universities, right? UC Merced has been such a tremendous asset for us because we have to figure out a way to do this all statewide, westwide, right? Nationwide. How do we live with our new climate and how do we design a forest, right? That forest of the future. So our kids and their kids will have a place to go, have a place to recreate um, because we are here forever. Let's figure this out. Let's figure it out together and then let's get it done. If you had one minute or a minute and a half and you knew it was your last minute and a half to make a powerful statement about what you know in your heart can happen and can be done. If it were your last pitch, what would it be? I would say this, Rob, we can um, manage our forests in California and throughout the West in a way that's going to allow us to not only survive a future climate, but thrive in that climate that will protect communities um, up and down the West Coast, that will allow our citizens to drink pure water, that will allow us to produce clean, renewable hydroelectric energy from these watersheds, that will allow um, the ecosystems that live in, the, the species that live in and around these ecosystems to not only survive, but thrive. I think that's an important mission. I think it's a mission that every Californian, that every American can get behind. And I think we can do it. We're, we know 
that active forest management works and we know that it's better to do forest management than it is to try to clean up after a fire. And we know that it's cheaper in the long run and better for all Americans if we can have an ecosystem that's sustainable now and in the future. It's fantastic. You have taken that message that you just shared right there from your watershed all the way to Washington. Your congressional uh, testimony has been phenomenal, your, your discussions with leaders, as well as here with me today. And I thank you so much. Well, um, it's been such a pleasure. Oh. Thank you for having me today. And I really appreciate uh, you sharing this story and sharing the watershed behind me. Um, hopefully we'll bring it into, into uh, people's homes and they can see what we enjoy here in Placer County every day. Austin Adams Schoenfeld LLP, focusing on business law and commercial litigation, is proud to support Rob on the Road, Region Rising. More information available at murphyaustin.com.